three people and you're going to have four weeks to do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it works. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello, I am Sam Fry, and welcome to Technique, the podcast where we speak to artists about technology. And guess what, folks? We made it. This is episode 50 of the show. This feels like quite a milestone for us on the podcast. We started this show around four and a half years ago and have interviewed an artist about technology around once a month ever since. So today, to celebrate that fact that it's episode 50, the show will be a chat between me and my co-host Richard Adams. We last did this for episode 25, which was some time ago. So we speak about what we've both been up to over the last couple of years. We reflect on these podcasts and why we do them. And we also talk a little about our plans for the future of this podcast. My hope is that this will help you get to know both of us a little better and you'll get a bit more excited about some of the new types of shows that we've got coming up. When we did last record together, it was in person in IBM's office in London. This time round, that wasn't quite possible. So we recorded this online from our houses. And we start the episode with me asking Richard what he's been up to recently, which you'll hear got quite a reaction. Been a couple of years since we last did one of these podcasts where we spoke to each other and, and just used it as an opportunity to catch up on, you know, what we've both been doing and our thoughts around the podcast in general. So since episode 25, which was probably two to three years ago, what's been the latest for you, Richard? Two to three years ago, I've, uh, <laughs> my, yeah, I've had quite a lot on in the last two to three years. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I've had so much going uh, up and down in the last two, three years, and we've still carried on and got these things done. It's credit I, to you. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it just made me laugh with the, the amount of stuff I've had to deal with. So I had to deal with critical illness. So I had to deal with all the fallout from that. I've had to then go off and produce all this art to deal with the trauma from the critical illness. I've got a new job. I'm, I'm day jobs, principal architect. So I'm designing systems for transport. God, what else? I've released three albums of music. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I've uh, done, done loads of stuff, really. I, I um, just keep going. That's what I'm like. I just keep making things. <laughs> it's just making me laugh because it's just suddenly thinking about summarising the last three years. I think I should write a book. You're prolific anyway, I think, in, in terms yeah. of you've always got a, a lot going on. I guess we we didn't ever really spend any time talking about some of the artwork that you've been working on in, in that time. You, pro- I think probably two, three years ago, you were starting to do some of the, the kind of selfie work that you... The, the, the um, that, anti-selfie you know, project was starting about then, yeah. So it was it, Exactly, to, but yeah. I think that's probably developed quite a bit since then and you've exhibited that as well. And So do you want to maybe talk about that work and what that works about, where you've got to, what's next for it? Sort of arose from spending a bit of time in hospital beds, really, and getting extremely ill and feeling that... You know, apart from my immediate close family, kids and and wife and stuff, I got very little help from people I would have expected to help. I think one of the things that struck me in the the phase of illness is how isolating being in a hospital is, how isolating it is because people don't want to talk to you. They will go out and they will talk on social media about how they support this activity and support that activity, but they won't pick up the phone and talk to someone close to them who's ill. That's a really weird thing. But I suppose it's, you know, it's partly out of fear. It's you know, all those sorts of things. So, it, you know, you lay there, you feel isolated. You're an artist. You think, Christ, am I going to die? Am I going to live? You know, you're starting to get night terrors, all that sort of stuff. And, and you, of course, you can't do anything in a hospital bed. But I did have me Surface Pro with me. And I had my phone and I was able to have pencils. 
And I just started taking photographs of myself. And I was also starting to get a bit angry at uh, social media, which some of you who follow me will notice I get angry occasionally on there. Winds me up like nobody's business. But it particularly wound me up because of this thing about isolation. I'm, I'm looking at someone's feed and they appear to have a perfect life. And of course, nobody does. Curate the hell out of it. And they put on, you know, this view of I'm this, I'm that. And then you see the people who humble brag, you know, the people who go, so this thing happened. And it's some sort of thing expecting a response saying, oh, aren't you clever and all of this. And you're laid there in a bed in a hospital wondering whether you're going to see the day out, you know. And you suddenly start to see it as incredibly false and corrosive. And that's what happened to me. I started looking at selfie culture as incredibly corrosive on my mental state, given what was going on. And I started taking selfies and destroying them, which is what I really started doing. Because I'd got that background in computing and computing and art in particular, and all I could operate with was this technology I had. I took some photos, I started writing and copying little algorithms, modifying them to move the images around uh, and to manipulate pixels. And then I would use the Surface Pro and the digital natural media paint package to paint into them. And of course, being art trained, I thought, well, what do I do here? And I'm talking about angst and I'm talking about anger and corrosiveness. And I think, well, the Northern European expressionists did all that. So Monk's Scream, up to Francis Bacon, back to Goya. There's a whole tradition of it going back about 400 years. I started making what I began to call these anti-selfies. So I, I felt they were almost like the picture of Dorian Gray. It was the picture in the attic that I was making. All the bad things from my life, my feelings, were in those, those pieces of work. And I did that partly as therapy to get over the PTSD and the stress and the trauma. Because actually I felt what I was doing was acting like a dam in a river. So you've got the water heading down the hill. It's going to swamp your house and wash it away. So you build a, a you reroute the river around the house. You build a dam and then you control the flow. And it felt like that work was doing that for the trauma. And it worked. Amazingly, it worked. It allowed me to produce all these self-portraits, which are in the style of Northern European expressionist painters of different ilks, showing different moods, showing terror, showing depression, showing anger. I then realized that what I needed to do, they were computer generated in the sense that they're, they're taken from photos or drawings and then algorithms on them and then digital painting them. So I needed to complete that journey as artifact. So then I decided actually the best way to finish this whole process off was to make them, uh, to render them on canvas and make them into real inverted comma paintings. So then they're, they're put on canvas so they look like real old school paintings. And I put them in frames that are distressed, fake distressed old frames. They've got fake woodworm holes in them. They're Rococo. They've got all the sort of flowery bits at the corners, the type of frames you'd see in the National Gallery. And then they needed to be hung. So I've exhibited them, and that, that's great. So I've gone through the process of creating these self-portraits through Northern European Expressionism, through computation, through digital media, the actors both a flow of all the bad stuff in me, all the bad stuff, the trauma, everything in the pieces of work, but also they're very caustic about selfie culture because they are selfies and they are anti-selfies as a result. And I, I genuinely feel, you know, social media and selfie culture is, is utterly corrosive, but it's also one of the few truly unique aesthetic movements that the West in particular has had in the last 20 or 30 years. If you think about it, selfies are everywhere. We've got, you know, televisions reflecting it. Reality television is just a version of selfie culture. It's allowing you to get onto television and you to be part of it, even though it's direct and it's cynical. But it is nonetheless part of selfie culture. So it operates on several levels. It operates as a, the work operates as what we call, what I call Baudrillardian simulacra. So Baudrillard talked about the concept of the simulacra, something that is a copy of something that never existed, which is what these are. They aren't actually like any particular real painting, but they feel like they could be. But they're all original. So, you know, and they are all, all of me, which kind of proves the originality. But they are simulacra. Then on top of that, they are 
treatment and therapy for trauma. Each painting is a statement of some sort of set of feelings. And then on the third level, they are this coruscation of selfie culture in general. And they're very uncomfortable viewing, some of them. You know, uh, when I did exhibit them, I had somebody come up and say very quietly to me in the gallery, that one there pointed at one of them. He said, that's how I felt when my son died. So, you know, I think they're very successful, but as I think they're very uncomfortable viewing. And, I, and also what I've found is galleries and dealers don't, don't know how to deal with them. They've given me all sorts of excuses. They've, they've gushed over how good they are and give me all sorts of excuses about why they wouldn't take any of them on. So, you know, but in a, in a sense, that, that would be a nice to have, but I didn't do it for that. I did it for the reasons I've stated. So I've done about 40 or 50 of them in the last couple of years, really, that are decent, and a, and a huge number of experiments. Where I take it next? I don't know. You know, I've been thinking about that. I don't know whether to take them into AR or whether to take them into VR or whether to go into something with machine learning that pulls out some more stuff about selfie culture. I don't know. I'm still sort of tossing those ideas around. I remember going to your exhibition in sort of Southwest London. I thought oh, it was great. It was really good to see them all together and, and see them displayed in that kind of setting. Do you think you're, you're likely, I guess it's difficult at the moment to exhibit but do you think you're you're likely to do more of that kind of thing as well? Yeah, I was thinking of taking over some shops, actually, when we can start moving, because all those shops are empty. There's a few other artists doing it. I think it occurs to me, go and see the owners of the shops and say, can I exhibit this work for a week? But I quite like the notion of putting it with real people, not the people you meet on LinkedIn or at conferences. These people who I think that when I was laid on the hospital bed talk a good game but don't follow through. It's interesting at that exhibition that you talked about and and when I've shown them to other people, it's ordinary people that react best to them. They get it. If I show them to somebody who is part of the mediocrity that runs things, they'll give you all sorts of fluff about it and they'll talk about it and this, that, the other, but never actually tell you anything about the work or what they think about it. It's all, it's very weird. It's, uh, they don't like seeing directness. And these things are incredibly direct pieces of work. You know, some of them are quite horrific when you look at them, actually. And when you tell you why it's appeared and why it's happened, and, and they go, oh, my God, I get that. And I found that, you know, your average person in the street has a better understanding of them than most educated people I've shown. The other thing that I remember asking you about, and you, you said that, you know, you've been creating artwork for years, but actually you probably haven't got it out and exhibited no, it much. Happened. And so, so that, even doing that, I guess that's a bit of a, a step change for you, just getting that stuff out there and, and trying to kind of present it in, well, there's a, in a kind there's of formal a way. Of, there's a number of things here that, yeah, I, I, you know, I used to do, obviously I'm trained in art. I went to four art schools. I became an art teacher. I've been a lecturer. I've, you know, and I've kept working, but, there was a period where I started to exhibit and then I stopped. And then jobs get in the way. You know, you start having kids and you start having to pay a mortgage. And, you know, I've been very lucky that I was technically very capable. So I got decent jobs. But those jobs don't give you much time outside, them, you know, if you're honest. And you could have still kind of do things. But, you know, the imperative to sort of display an exhibit wasn't there. But this particular project had to be exhibited to complete the project. Because, as I said, they were simulacrum. Each one's a simulacrum. They're simulacrum. They, in order to be a simulacrum, they can't just be on canvas in a frame. They've also got to be in a gallery. So I think there was an aesthetic, intellectual justification for exhibiting them. But also, in the meantime, I'd also been ramping up the music. So like many people my generation, we were all in bands when we were sort of 19 and 18. And so I've always been working with music, and I taught art and music in a school for a while. I'm a reasonably competent musician. And again, the technology, and this is the in, this is why I'm interested in technology. You know, the technology is now so easily available to allow you to make music. I've been able to make very complex music relatively easily because it's all in the head. But again, music, in a way, even more so than visual art, doesn't exist if other people don't hear it. Old school philosophy, isn't it? If a, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, does it actually exist? And music, I 
started putting the music out on Spotify and the streaming services, and you know, I, you know, I'm not Ed Sheeran, um, and the music certainly isn't easy listening. But you know, I get forty, fifty, you know, active listeners a month, and it's growing slowly. But that also helped me to have confidence as well in the work, because I thought I put that out and thought, well, I care less about the music than I do about these pieces of work. These pieces of work are part are really part of me. So exposing yourself is quite a tough thing to do, especially with such bad stuff behind it. The music, not so. The music was just stuff I like to do and I enjoy and, and stuff. And so you put that out. But then you get over the hump of being worried about showing people. And so, yeah, you know, I've started to engage and I will have exhibitions from time to time in different ways. But I'm not going to be gallery driven. I'm not that type of person, never was, never will be. I'm sure galleries will actually pick up some of the work and make a lot of money from it when I'm dead. But, you know, to hell with them. To my mind, most of the dealers and galleries that I've been to, and I've been to a lot over the last three or four years to have a look, just deal in wall decoration. I'm slightly cynical, but a lot of the stuff they actually sell that's cynical to me is no more than what you might buy in an Ikea poster shop. You know, um, I think when art's commoditized to that level, it, it loses some of its human value. It, it happens, and I'm not knocking it's just there. You know, it happens, uh, but it does lose its value. A dealer said to me about the digital works that, yeah, I really like them and I'd like to take them on, but if it was only one that existed, you know, I'd be able to sell these at three, four, five, and 6,000 for you. And I said, well, there is only one. He said, yeah, but it's a digital file. I said, but I'm only I'm only making one. I said whoever buys it can have the file. So what's the difference? You know, it's yeah, but there might be a copy of it. And I said, well, you know, I've got a 24 megapixel camera with a thousand pound piece of glass on the front. I can take a photo of a painting, print it up, texture it up, and you'd never know the difference half the time. It's easy to fake things now. You know, the reality is I'd give them the files. But no, there's still a, still a thing. And I think it, this is something we might want to explore in the podcast about curating and keeping and selling computer and digital art of all kinds. You know, how do you take something that is ultimately infinitely reproducible and keep value on it? And I know there are people on that front selling uh, blockchain stuff to go with work, to verify work and things. And there are ways of doing that. But, but yeah, I'm not overly obsessed with getting in galleries, but I've now had, I think, take out lockdown. Before lockdown, I had two full exhibitions in, in the sort of two years. Uh, so one exhibition I showed photography and some digital paintings and the second exhibition, these anti-selfies. So I do a lot of photography as well. So there's that. I don't know. I, it's, I don't feel, I feel like, I feel very nervous about selling bits of me that are so personal into a system that doesn't value anything, it just prices things. At this point, we thought we would flip the question around a little bit to talking about what I've been up to. So I talk a bit about what I've been up to at work, my growing interest in screen printing, and some reflections on the podcast during this time. So I work for IBM during the day, still doing that, still working as a consultant. In my work, the area that I've probably shifted slightly is that I have become a lot more product focused, a bit more innovation focused. So I spent quite a lot of the last two, three years setting up an innovation lab at Ford, which was really great. That innovation lab was all about making sure there was a structure in place to be able to say, here is a problem or here is a need, what can we test and how can we take a hypothesis and actually see whether or not there's value behind that and actually do that in a very quick way, do some kind of, you know, it could be a paper prototype, it could be whatever, to get that insight to be able to decide whether or not something should happen off the back of it. It wasn't about building things really. Sometimes to do it, you need to build something technical to be able to test that thing. But, but actually that was great. Um, and then I've done some product focused roles at a couple of places. I've, I've been involved in a couple of different industrial organizations and, and done some work in government as well. But then outside of work, I have got more interested in screen printing, which is something I talked to you a little bit about, Richard. Probably a few years ago now, I started going to Print Club London, 
they have a, a yearly exhibition called blisters i think it's called and, it, and it's they're really it's really fun it's like a it's almost like a bit of a party but they're they're selling these screen prints as well so you go there and there's there's like a dj playing and there's beers being sold and some food to eat and then there's all these really cool big screen prints that you can buy and i thought they were really interesting to look at they might fit into that category in some places of that ikea style wall art but I, there's something really nice about it and I, I wasn't sure what i liked about that but i decided off the back of it that i clearly there's something around screen prints that i am visually drawn to so i decided that i wanted to do some kind of class and i went to originally i wanted to, i was thinking of going to print club london but it's the other side of london for me i'm based in south london and so I found a place called Third Rail Print, which is in Peckham. And so Peckham got a bit of a regeneration going on in general, but they've got this uh, this big site of artists in Peckham called Peckham Levels. And within there is a screen printing studio. And so they do some classes and I did a day class, really enjoyed it. I, I painted a pineapple. Basically, that's what I had. <laughs> it was a pineapple that I, I designed and I, I had the word for pineapple in Portuguese because my, my girlfriend is from Brazil. So I had pineapple and an abacashi underneath it. I realised not only do I like the visual, I really enjoy just the, the physical, tactile nature of doing screen printing. So definitely decided I want to do more of that. I then paid to do a, another kind of follow-on class and I was thinking, oh, maybe I could pay for some kind of drop-in times where I can use that that facility and just play around and ex experiment in there. All of that coincided with 2020 and a lot of that that space being shut. So I, I've, I have been playing around with some of that stuff and I've got my own kind of screen printer. You can always see it probably behind me. Huh? I'll grab it. I've got this kind of All right. personal screen printing set up i'm showing richard a portable board <laughs> i've almost made myself it's a, it's a portable table with a with a, a i forget the name of them now but green print frame on a screen on it i guess and yeah. so I, I played around with that a bit it's a little bit hard to do some of that stuff to a, a good level in your house without more professional equipment but but i definitely i definitely think that's something i want to do more of i don't really have a kind of specific goal around that but i i definitely like them visually definitely enjoying playing around with, with the process of it um, and then and then there's these these podcasts which i guess really openly i guess i think there's been points I've, i love doing the podcast and i'm like oh i just kind of interviewed someone and that that was really fun and and, and actually i learned a lot and i found that really engaging and then i spend time editing and sometimes that sinks in more as you're editing through it and that's been good but there's other times i think well why am i doing this I, i'm questioning okay is that is the reason for doing it four or five years ago when we started doing this the same as as it is now and so that's why i think we've started to kind of evolve this this idea of you know trying out doing these podcasts in different ways we, we had some conversations about about that but also to kind of go well maybe maybe there is some more depth or maybe there is like other ways of exploring topics rather than just talking to individuals because as much as those individuals might be interesting sometimes getting different perspectives on the same topics are really a really good way to no, I, I think there's absolutely the that is absolutely the way otherwise all radio documentaries would be single interviews the reality is when you cut together people's different takes on things you suddenly realize that there are there is more than one way of thinking about stuff i don't think enough people think that you know there's a lot an awful lot of people out there who think their way is is it and to have that challenged, I think, is, is really good. And one of the things I get from the podcasts is a sense of challenge because, I, I you know, I talk to people. I'm quite chatty in those interviews. You know, I make assertions right, left and centre. I, I do anyway. Unlike a lot of people, I'm very, very happy to have them pulled to pieces, the assertions. And I think when you frame them, assertions, and you put them to people and they challenge you, is when you really start beginning to learn because you're, they're challenging what you thought you thought and and i find that a very useful tool for me like you said you you do these things you do the interviews you come away thinking yeah that's right you know and every single bit of that feeds into every single bit of the work i do over the last few years and particularly with lockdown there has been an explosion in terms of podcasts i think mean, that's the other thing i was sort of questioning in my mind actually you know, with so many people doing podcasts, do I still want to be doing podcasts? Is that really still the right medium? 
because actually there's more and more people out there more, doing more more of them all all kind of putting this material out there but i i think my reflection on it has been a similar thing to what you were just saying that the reason i do it which is to meet people and to learn and to kind of to kind of get to grips and understand certain things definitely still is there and that's that is the primary purpose of, of why I do those po- the podcasts in general. And I think it's the same for you, but actually taking that angle and saying, well, well, actually, if that is the case, why don't we take a subject and really dive into that? No, I agree. That, I agree. that is where we'll get more out of it personally. And, and so that's why I think we're going in that sort of direction. No, 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 I agree. And I think, I think it's a good evolution. It's a natural move to move into a radio style of podcast. I think. Changing the format allows you to change the way you ask the questions, the way you uh, put the answers together. And by adopting a more radio style format, it stops being less about the opinionated chat uh, that goes off in most podcasts and starts becoming a considered piece of work in the same way people write blogs and they write books. There's nothing wrong with a blog. You get there's some incredible blogs incredibly well written but they are not books because books have that editing process and they have that process of keeping it within certain limits and they have the context that suddenly once it becomes a book it's been judged against other books rather than against other blogs and similarly with these podcasts i think one of the things i'm interested in as an artist is you take the next step how does this thing that you're doing evolve uh, and i think evolving it towards being a, a radio style miniseries it's a really great idea. It will be judged against content like that rather than against podcasts. Some podcasts already do that, but, you know, most don't. One of the things is, I think, since we've been doing this podcast, is we have talked to people we know, people we've had recommended, and people we're interested in who've got work that is interesting in some way to us. And I think both of us have got a lot from doing the podcast, and I hope, I hope the audiences have got that, because actually what the, you know, one of the ways I explain it to people is we are two real enthusiasts. We're not doing it for the money. We're not trying to make a media career out of it. A whole of that would be lovely. But we're doing it because we're genuinely interested in the subject matter. And I think it is interesting that over the time we've done it, I think it's become clear that there is more you can go into on different subjects. And I think, you know, your suggestion, we've decided to do these design thinking pieces, a four-part mini-series, that will feel more like, I guess, a Radio 4 programme or a public broadcast service documentary-type mini-series where there's a theme through the programmes and we intercut interviews with different people answering a narrative question. And I think that's a very good way for us to mature because I think a lot of podcasts still take things episodically. Whereas what that would do is for me is give us over a year, say if we did three of those, it would give us three short series of programs with real themes where you can go into depth with things because I know people go into depth on podcasts because they make them two hours long and half hours long, but it's not the same as having a properly tightly edited thematically linked serial as opposed to series yeah exactly and that doesn't mean we're not going to keep doing the one-to-one interviews but but actually i also think where we've been really strict on saying okay we're going to have a an interview every month and that's going to be our format and that's sometimes that's been a really good push probably for both of us to go right we need to get out there we need to get another interview done sometimes sometimes those have come really naturally and gone oh they've sort of you, you want to do one and suddenly you've got like three or four lined up and that that sets you up really well for the next few months but also they're really ones that you you're desperate to do and, and other times we've kind of gone all right well who who could we speak to uh, and trying to to fill that gap i think personally i'm a little bit less precious of whether or not it needs to be absolutely every month going forward it probably will be roughly once a month anyway i think that is kind of the nature of what we've done but it's nice to go right let's let's set ourselves up and so we picked design thinking as a theme probably about six months ago and went right well what, what would that look like as as a three or four part mini series who should we speak to what kinds of topics do we want to explore at this point we well, haven't also, put those together about, but we what is it about design thinking that that is interesting to both of us okay at this point let me explain what we are planning 
In a month or two, we will be releasing a three or four episode mini series on design thinking. For those that don't know, design thinking is a common term that many industries use to describe being human centered when innovating. Companies around the world are using design thinking to challenge themselves to be human centric when solving problems, developing and testing ideas. An industry has been made around this. Many companies are providing design thinking training to their employees. Others have set up design thinking departments and several organizations provide design thinking consultancy services. The theory is that teams across organizations should be taught to be more empathetic and focus on their customers' needs so they can create better solutions. Essentially, whatever your role in business, you are being asked to behave and think more like designers, artists, and creatives. Yet how similar is design thinking in business to design and artistic practice? Well, over the last few months, Rich and I have been speaking to artists, designers, educators, and to businesses, as we wanted to find out whether design thinking as a business process has much relation to the practice of working artists and designers. So look out for the series. Each episode will look at a particular theme, its background, the link between design thinking in business and the arts, and what people see as its future. Anyway, that was a little aside. Let's get back to the discussion and you'll hopefully get a good sense of what's to come in that mini series. You actually suggested the topic. So, you know, what is it that's sort of grinding your gears, if you like? (laughs) So design thinking is something I use in my work life every day. And as a concept, sometimes it's taught as a, this is a methodology. You go from A to a to E and you go through these set of steps and and that will get you to a place where you've got a really clear idea of what what to go and build in terms of software. Now, I, I think that's a bit of a misunderstanding, but actually in some ways that's that's the way that businesses have always thought about things. They go, right, our way we, we follow a process. We've had waterfall techniques of going, let's do this, this phase followed by this phase followed by this phase and design thinking is an evolution of that. But actually when, when people talk about it and, and really say, well, what is design thinking? And they say, well, it's about thinking like a designer or an artist. It's about replicating those, that mental approach to addressing a project and actually you look at it from a user's perspective. Now I just wanted to understand, well, is that how they think? Because yes, that's, that's what we talk about in business, but actually is is that really, is design thinking as we think about it in business, really what artists or designers are taught in, in their education? And is that what they do practically, they say? I, I have a little bit of a hypothesis in my head that they're probably not quite exactly the same, but I don't really know what the differences are. And that that's why I wanted to explore that as a topic. Well, I must admit, as someone who has also used design thinking during the, you know, during the day job quite a lot, but also in education, sort of delivering things, you know, sort of within that framework. I, I guess my approach and why I'm interested in is whether the notion of design thinking as an industry has sort of achieved a hegemony that's going to be hard to shift and that actually is damaging. Is it too much of an industry now? Should it be just a way of thinking? I mean. We talk about, you know, agile and design thinking a lot in businesses now, as you've said, rather than waterfall, yet waterfall still has its place. Design thinking will always, that that approach to things will probably always have its place. And now we are designing software, agile, or or some sort of agile process uh, will, will probably always exist. Um, but you, I question sometimes, and I'm quite cynical about the fact that it seems to become an industry and that there are ways of doing things. And if you're not in that industry, you can't possibly have an opinion. If you are educated about something and you challenge it, you know, it's called BS, you know, all these things. And I also wonder as an artist, as a practicing artist, design thinking's never seemed too far away from the artistic process I used. It's always felt like the artistic process that I was taught through four art schools was a mixture of agile and design thinking anyway. That that adds to my cynicism because I think have companies taken things that already existed and just repackaged them? There was, I guess, in the back of my mind as well, there was one of the interviews that was done quite early on. It was one of the ones that you did with Hazel Green. Mm. And in that, you talked about, I think she was particularly talking about 
where she's based and and having been based in places like the pervasive media studio in bristol and and seeing all these these artists that are at the forefront of really trying out testing experimenting with things and you know failing and and messing things up and then go oh maybe there's an opportunity over there let's do this and she talked about those people that that actually explore it in the first place and often they're not the ones that end up taking that to that mass market or or really get that recognition of the stuff that's been done. Someone spots it, and that that could be and it's someone from all kinds of different places. It might be an education, it might be an organisation, you know, might be a uh, someone that's got a bit of a, a startup mindset and goes right, oh, that's really good. I'll go take that. But normally, it gets taken a little bit away from those people and then turned into something something else and and recognised elsewhere. And I think that was also in the back of my mind that that concept of actually design thinking it's talked about almost exclusively in the business world I, I haven't really heard many artists that we've been talking about going oh yeah I, I use design thinking and that's not necessarily in their their lexicon but i don't and think they think about it may, and maybe not and and actually I, I was also just intrigued to go well you know do are they aware of it are they aware of that term being used if so what do they think of it are they happy that that's being approached and maybe there's a better understanding of of some of that that general approach and mindset or are they a bit bitter about it i, d- I don't know so that's yeah. exactly what i wanted to look into really um and and just see well it's quite easy to look at that world as okay it's a bunch of tech companies mainly probably using design thinking as a way of understanding problems understanding user needs and and designing software products but actually why not just take it back to the root a bit? What, what's the, where's it come from? And what is that slightly larger world around it? What is design thinking, not just in that one environment, but well, what's the perspective that, on it elsewhere? That perspective, that's interesting because somebody, a friend of mine who's extremely senior in the design industry, said to me, the one thing they thought about design thinking was that it had been hijacked and used to replace design in a lot of places. So you go through a design process like design thinking, but you're not actually designing, you know, and it's been used to replace classic design processes, which worked extremely well. And, and I think that, you know, I've never really thought of it like that, I must admit. And it's, it's interesting. This is what you get when you talk to people, obviously, about these things. And, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still thinking about it a few weeks later <laughs> and juggling that comment in my head because, that's kind of what I'm saying about the fact that I went to art school and did the fa- classic foundation course and it was worth something. And then the degree and that foundation course took us through all sorts of processes, techniques, you know, whatever. And so when I first came across design thinking, I just thought that's a foundation course approach. But when you look at it, it doesn't have the depth of the foundation course. But we did all the other things that Agile and think and Lean does. You know, we iterated. If you think about an artist, they fail and fail fast continually. They continually iterate. If they hit a dead end, they go another route. They get fed up of a theme. They take another theme from the backlog and start down that route. And then that's similar with the design thinking thing, the way they spread ideas out. I, I certainly know many artists who, in their head, are thinking like the post-it wall note wall is supposed to be. And we do, we jump, we associate continually, which is what that post-it note wall metaphor really is about. It's for getting some associations and associative ideas out next to each other and showing everyone that actually you're all thinking the same thing or you're thinking six things or you're, you know, the, the, the sorts of things. But that, you know, artists often carry that in their head and do that in their sketchbooks. And, and I'm using visual artists here, but actually all artists do it. And what artists do above all else, good artists of any kind, is they immerse themselves in what they're doing. And it's total immersion. And it's never they're never not looking at things. They're never not listening to things. They're never not reading. They're never not talking. And design thinking should be, and you know, at its best, when it is doing a similar sort of thing of getting you immersed into what you're doing. And it's back to that, you know, things like the concept of flow. I think design thinking is a way of, or was a way of getting people into that flow state. And I think it's now become a method as opposed to a a gateway to a state of mind.
there you go. That was our catch up. As we mentioned, there will be a mini series on design thinking coming up where we will talk about that topic even more. Before that comes out though, we will still have some great interviews coming up where we will speak to artists about their work and how they use technology. The next one is with Tim Kinberg, who you might remember from episode 27, titled Technology for Skeptics. Well, he's just published a book called Vampires of Avonmouth, and Richard caught up with him about the book and what we are seeing in the world of technology. So look out for that episode coming soon. Also, we have a special episode coming up titled What Technology Can Learn From The Arts, which includes some of the highlights of what we've learned from artists over the last few years on technique. So lots to look forward to. To make sure that you don't miss any of these shows, make sure that you take a moment to subscribe to this episode and ideally give it a five star rating. So until the next one, I just wanted to say take a very good care of yourself. Goodbye.